let's start talking about this issue of place and belonging in, yes. in, in terms of, so you've talked about the global impacts of how one well that we've mm. seen in, mm. in you know, 300 kilometers west of Brisbane is yes. connected to the world Indeed. Uh, through the global gas market, right? Mm. But as you say, there is a, there's a local impact. Mm. So can you tell us a little bit about notions of place and belonging that you've used to make sense of that sort of impact it's had on the landscape? Yeah, look, I, part of my research here has a historical component. I, I think uh, it is very important to, if we are to understand what is here now and the people who live in a particular place, we need to understand how, they came, how that place came to be. Um, and uh, in the Darling Downs, where we've been, um, there's a fascinating history, um, as, in, as in all places for that matter, um, where we see quite uh, dramatic transformations over time since what you might call colonial um, experiences started, which is not all that long ago, say 160 years ago uh, in some places. Um, we see, well, firstly, uh, the d dislocation of Aboriginal populations, right? Um, and we see in explorers' attitudes to this environment a strong focus on natural resources. So we see glowing reports of luxurious grasslands suitable for cattle and so on. We see reports about um, abundant coal lying at the surface in creeks and so on, um, indicating that early uh, views of this environment were heavily focused on extraction and, and the use of resources, um, which then brought in a, a pastoral industry um, and uh, mining, extractive practices and so on. So there, there were coal mines? There were coal mines? 100 years ago. Indeed. 150 years ago. Yeah. Um, 100 years ago we've, we've seen some of the, um, the heritage now um, in that region uh, refers back to that coal mining history. And th this I think is very important in understanding what is here today because we see um, uh, at that site where there was an old coal mine um, we see now very productive agricultural land. Now that agricultural land is there actually because of that coal mine because when the coal mine went bust uh, the, the, um, the coal workers were given land uh, around the coal mine um, who then cleared that land and made it um, into the kind of agricultural land that it is today. Um, and while we see now among farmers a very um, anti-coal attitude in some of these regions, um, you know, this kind of historical transformation um, uh, makes that story much more complex, right? Uh, where the background of farming is very strongly related to coal mining and this kind of extractive history. So I was born in Chinchilla. Mm -hmm. I grew up on this farm and I've been farming here for the last 20 years. Um, my family's been in this area for over a century mm -hmm. and yeah, I'm fourth generation farmer on, on this property. What, what do you grow? Um, what kind of farm is this, um, so to speak? It's a, it's a cropping farm. Mm -hmm. We don't have any livestock. We're uh, wheat, sorghum, cotton, um, pulse crops, mung beans, chickpeas. We were approached by uh, two gas companies. This property's got a tenure line through the middle of it mm -hmm. to put wells on this property. And at the time, their approach was, I think, particularly bad. It was basically, this is what we're going to do to your property. This is how much we're going to pay you. And if you don't like it, we'll see you in the land court. That was yep. basically the, the approach. So um, I started doing a fair bit more research about what my rights actually were and uh, discovered that there was a bit more to it than that and that they didn't have it all their way. So I quite like, you know, to be by myself and yes. do my own thing. Yeah, and yeah. I don't need mm. to see people. My wife complains actually that I very rarely go to town. I might only go to town three or four times a year. Oh, right. So okay. I'm, I'm quite happy out here. Mm, mm, um, mm. But, yeah, it's... it's uh, Mm. It's not a good feeling, you mm. know, because you've got people looking at what you're doing and mm. Mm. in the road and you, yeah. And you have young children? Um, have young yeah. children. Mm. It's an, also another concern is because, mm. you know, they're to the stage now where they're riding motorbikes and, yep. and things like that. So mm. they'll be out doing whatever they want to do and, mm. Mm. and you've got people in your property, there's a risk of accidents. In fact, we almost had one a couple of years ago with, mm. Mm. with uh, 
um, when they were constructing a pipeline. Growing up in Tara was a very small town environment mm. and everybody knew each other. Mm. Um, we had farming communities mm. and when I was growing up oil in the, in the district was very a big thing and mm. it made the town prosper. That and was in the 1960s I yeah. believe, yeah? Yep. Mm -hmm. And during that time we also uh, sheep prices were good and mm. lots of people had wool and sold wool and okay. and mm -hmm. the farmers and graziers were doing very well because the commodity mm. prices were pretty good for that time. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And that's when the swimming pool was built, mm -hmm. the hall was built there was plenty of money about and plus the oil yeah. and we ha also had the lo local Tara Shire Council mm -hmm. which they were really for the town and district and they mm. made all the bitumen roads and mm. Mm. Tara was thriving when I was growing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You seem to be contrasting that though to the next uh, saying it's different now is it? Yes, it, it is different now uh -huh. because we are in drought yes. and we have been for such a long time mm. and and the other thing is commodity prices, mm. wheat, sheep, cattle and all that hasn't risen with the times mm. and so lots of farmers, they're doing it real tough. As we say, we moved here purely because we needed that peace and quiet because on the coast with the hoons or just people walking up and down the street, sure. he would not sleep. And where, where are we at the moment? Uh, for, for those uh, we're in William Villa, 36 kilometres south of Chinchilla, um, 37 k's north of Tara. Yep. Uh, what they say, about three and a half hours from Brisbane. Yep. Uh, we've got 155 acres here, mm -hmm. we run a few cows and yeah, the idea was to move out and like I say, peace and quiet for the kids. Mm. You know, it was basically, I suppose, somewhere where we could come do our own bit, but the kids still had their healing time because mm -hmm. both both have cerebral palsy. Okay. So yeah. you know, it's yeah, rest, relaxation, clean air. Yes. And, and when did you come here again, John? We, uh, 2004. Yeah. Five. Okay. And. Um, yeah, there wasn't a thing, you know, like, it was bliss. Yeah, was it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm, we, mm -hmm. Well, it was, we didn't even have any neighbours. No. Like, only the guys across the road, which are probably yeah, nearly 3k away, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of guys moved in, um, probably 2k's down the road. That was the first sort of neighbours we had. So what attracted you to this spot in particular? Well, we like, like the... You know, the, mm. the open spot, well, yeah. I suppose the size, 155 acres, yeah. so yeah. we've got a nice little buffer yeah. between any neighbours. And, and it was affordable at the time as well oh, to yeah. buy 150 acres, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 135,000, you know, yeah. like mm. we mm. sort of thought, mm. how, mm. how can you go past it type mm. thing? Mm. And I think that's what got a lot of people out here, mm. was, you know, the actual cost. And mm. like, people say, oh, well, you know, you're doing it rough, and at the end, in the beginning, we were. You like you like uh, you mentioned the birds and, and so on. You you uh, you're well, we a bit of to, a. We uh, used to have twenty odd king parrots that used to uh -huh. come to the back door and uh -huh. feed them. And if the door was open, they'd fly inside the house. You mm. know, hey, I'm here, want some grain, mm. and no, just mm. gone. Next to no frogs anymore. There's next to no birds anymore. Mm. So mm. All seen, in the last few years. Yeah, uh, haven't yeah. seen a goanna for I don't know, yeah, probably three years. Right. You know. Mm. And, they used to be here, everywhere, mm. just gone. You mentioned as we walked um, uh, around, um, black rain. Uh, what, what was that all about? Oh, it just sort of, yeah, it turned up, I suppose. Um, you know, like before the rain, basically, and mm. then it was like you sort of didn't, we didn't really notice it because mm. when it started raining, you just go inside. Mm. And then come out one day, there was more of a milky substance, you know, that w wasn't there the day before. On the cars, yeah. yeah. Mm, and mm. same on the tanks and that, you mm. know, but um, even saying that now, we still, as the rain falls, we still get that same white stuff and it'll run off the tank there white and turn black underneath the lips. So mm. as it settles, it sort of turns back to that same sort yeah, of black. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I say, you can only liken it to a concentrated form of the pollution you get in the city. Right. Mm. Uh, and people say, oh yeah, but that takes ages to build up. And I say, mm. yes, in the city it does, but I said it can happen here overnight. Mm.